Before, while I uh, get my presentation started, I also want to make sure that I, I myself congratulate you uh, for the recent uh, uh, award and recognition um, by Green Destinations. I know that this was mentioned in the talk. I didn't know exactly how, but, um, but I know it was. Um, it's really uh, important, I feel, in today's day and age to recognize and to talk and to um uh, to be open transparent and frequently talk about sustainability efforts and achievements uh also from a psychological point of view because as camilla mentioned we live at times when we are um surrounded by a lot of uncertainty also of course many of us are wondering how much resources um something will require and whether it's smart to invest a lot of resources because of this uncertainty um, but the reality is that there's no question that we should all be moving towards making sustainability non-negotiable. Uh, and in that sense, the more there are examples uh, of how this can be done, and the more there are examples out there uh, of how people are making effort and destinations and, and businesses together are, are moving the needle wherever they, they can, uh, the more we are actually changing that perception that there's no other way and the more we will gather more and more um, of our partners, collaborators, stakeholders to actually join the movement. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to talk to you about how understanding human psychology and how people really make decisions, process information and take action can help make sustainability effortless and non-negotiable and part of smart uh, tourism business. So just making sure the screen is moving. You can see the next slide, correct? No. No? <laughs> can you see the, can you still see the cover slide or you see a, an old car on the screen? We see you. We see you. <laughs> ah, this is strange. Okay, and let's do something else. Okay, so sharing screen. Let's see. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, now yes. We got it. Okay. Fantastic. And then is it moving now? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Okay. So to start my talk, I'm going to use an analogy from the automotive industry. So some of you might remember or might have seen from images that cars back in the years looked something like this. Today, they look something like this. And in addition to the obvious um, uh, design and comfort improvements, something else has dramatically changed. And that's the utilization of smart technology and smart design in a way that enhances or actually uh, ensures uh, safety behavior behind the wheel. For example, you will sit, you will sit, today you will sit in your car and the likelihood is that if you, for, uh, for some reason, forget to put your safety belt on, there will be an extremely annoying and strong sound on. So unless you're extremely, extremely stubborn or very, very fond of annoying sounds, the likelihood is that it will take you just a few seconds to put your safety belt on. If you're driving and you get distracted um, or you make a poor judgment and you are driving too fast, um, given the um, the other vehicles on the road, the likelihood is that a contemporary car will signal to you based on an estimate of uh, distances and uh, your driving speed that you are um, engaging in a maneuver which is high risk. And if things get really, really dangerous, for example, uh, uh, a pedestrian jumps on the street or you actually really approach uh, another vehicle, the action will become non-negotiable. The car will actually automatically stop um, and uh, move from signaling to actually taking over the action. All of these uh, examples and all of these features in contemporary cars are placed there to eliminate the mistakes that we make based on what um, what I describe as human realism, because we know that even if people are very experienced, even if 
uh, if they're very familiar with the road they're taking. In many, many instances, there's psychological and behavioral um, failures or mistakes that we make that could lead to an unpleasant situation at the very least with the material loss and so on, um, or even to something very extreme um, such as loss of life or heavy uh, physical injury. And because of that, while also being successful as an industry and make a good business, contemporary um, producers of um, uh, of cars have increasingly been incorpor incorporating these features that define the immediate context in which our driving behavior unfolds in a way that makes safety very easy, sometimes completely automated, and as I gave the example, in many cases, non-negotiable. I think all, all of us can agree that in addition to being more pleasant, contemporary driving is much, much safer. And of course, data is there to support that. Now, I know some of you will say that um, the car design and these safety features are not everything. Of course, when we talk about solving something as complicated and as socially important as safety on the roads, um, infrastructure is also extremely important. Um, um, traffic policies and regulations are also extremely important. Their proper enforcement is also extremely important. But the behavior, the immediate behavior behind the wheel actually also has an important role. So if with the design and the human realism of design in cars, so we can actually solve a significant share of the situations in which we make mistakes, then, of course, everything else will complement that. Now, my suggestion, using this analogy at the beginning, is that given that our own sector is facing a significant challenge ahead amidst a lot of uncertainty and moving sands, it's actually wise to use the same approach, to apply the same level of human realism in order to begin making sustainability easy non-negotiable where that's needed, and actually more likely as a behavior. And again, this doesn't mean that we will uh, solve the full challenge, but if we can cover the first few miles of the journey with similar approaches that automate sustainable behavior and make it easy, I think it's the smart thing to do. So let me talk, talk you through that way of thinking. Before um, giving you some examples uh, that would apply to our industry, I want to take a moment and explain why we know from behavioral sciences that sustainability is actually difficult from uh, the perspective of how the human brain works and the principles that drive human behavior. In fact, I'm not going to go through the uh, through the theory. Obviously, we don't have much time for that. But I'm going to use um, uh, a statement that's made by one of the uh, most popular behavioral scientists of our time, Dan Ariely. Some of you may have read uh, some of his uh, uh, fantastic books. So what Dan Ariely says is that if you are to put together a team of the most brilliant behavioral scientists and you task them with the challenge to design a problem that would be nearly impossible for human beings to solve, it would be something like climate change. We are behaviorally wired to, um, to not solve challenges such as climate change, which are um, complicated, uh, very intangible, extended over time, overwhelming in many um, in many ways. Now, that is even more applicable to the context of travel and leisure. When we talk about travelers or people who are in leisure mode, dealing with sustainability or climate change um, or, or the climate crisis is even more difficult. Why is it so? Psychologically, when we are um, on a holiday or when we are uh, taking a break and are in leisure mode, 
we naturally prioritize the experience that we are engaged in. We are within a destination for a certain period of time. Of course, we want to get the best out of it. And even on a value level, if we are committed to sustainability values, we would always prioritize the experience over co contributing to sustainability. Release of control is something that is also uh, very well established and described in uh, traveler behavior, behavior literature. Think about the following. Maybe during regular um, times of the year when you are at home um, on, on your normal living and working routine, you are very disciplined about um, eating healthy, about not eating sweets, about not drinking wine during the week, perhaps just a glass or two on a Saturday and so on, because this is what keeps you going and it, this is what uh, um, ensures your physical and, and mental well-being. Now, when you go on holiday, imagine uh, Southern Italy, Certainly, you're going to, to be taking wine every day and perhaps even not only with dinner, but with lunch, because you are in a place where wine is fantastic and you want to, um, to, to experience it. If you're traveling in Turkey, of course, you will eat sweets and probably do that every day because it's the capital of sweets. Desserts are to die for. So these are examples for how when we are traveling or in leisure mode, we tend to release controls in the same manner we release behavioral controls that relate to responsible consumption and sustainability. So even if at home we're very diligent about recycling, managing our energy use or water consumption, when we are in leisure mode, we are more lenient towards ourselves and we tend to be um, uh, less strict with these behaviors. The other thing we need to recognize is that even though in the last uh, couple of years we see data that shows that people are more and more aware and concerned about climate and sustainability, they still uh, feel that sustainability in, in the climate crisis and actions related to them are in direct conflict with the state of leisure. So even if they're socially responsible and they understand that all of us need to play a role, when they're taking that break, when they're enjoying that Sunday afternoon with their family, they feel direct conflict with being asked to be responsible and to be contributing to, to climate action. And that's, um, uh, again, proven psychologically. Of course, in many cases, um, we don't have enough information and we engage similar to the, uh, the, the, to the driving example, we engage in automated behavior. When we reach out and grab a, a, a bottle of, uh, of water in a, a single use plastic, not because we are very fond of it, but because while we are talking um, with somebody at the event, this is the, um, the closest thing next to us. So this is why this context thinking is actually quite important uh, and can influence behavioral outcomes. But what I wanted to, to note with these few points is to explain why it is actually difficult to tackle sustainability, especially in the more classical approaches that we have taken, um, which are through educating uh, travelers and customers, giving them information, and hoping that this will change their behavior. These are the arguments explaining why psychologically that actually is not very effective. Because when we talk about sustainability and human behavior, it's not about values and responsibility. It is actually about human nature and how the mind and the behavior of all of us as people works. So, of course, the natural question is, what can we do about it now that we have that information? My suggestion uh, is that we apply the same human realism um, that has been applied in the automotive industry to make sustainability effortless, to make sustainability the most likely choice. And to make sustainability part of good business practice, the same way that it has happened in the car industry, which has been uh, successful in the market, but which hasn't uh, compromised on applying that human realism. 
So what are the tools that we can utilize in order to have to apply that behavioral realism and make influence the context in which the traveler or the leisure experience happens in a similar manner um, as uh, as driving. Some of you who have had a chance to look at the smart ways manual, which Camilo mentioned, uh, will note that some of the solutions that we use um, in uh, programs uh, using behavior smart thinking are extremely simple. How uh, one perceives information and what kind of a decision they, they make sometimes depends on on the use of on the replacing of one word versus another word on presenting the order of information differently on framing one and the same piece of information in a different way or placing focus on one part of the sentence versus the other so some of these techniques are actually very very simple and they have an influence on the final behavior that uh, one takes to decide but Overall, um, there's a few points that I want to make as, uh, as examples uh, that apply to, to our industry. When it comes to making behavior, um, uh, sustainable behavior easy uh, and um, prevalent, one of the most powerful changes that we should be looking at is to make sustainability the default option. Now, I know across Scandinavia, this is the practice uh, uh, this is um, uh, uh, the prevalent practice, but not um, everywhere around the world. Uh, I'm talking about the changing towels at hotels. Now, this is a super easy example of how flipping the default option can be extremely powerful. Instead of asking people to be the ones who are taking actions and making the choice whether a towel should be changed, make non-changing towels the default option versus changing towels. We know from behavioral sciences that the default option itself is usually what people go for, the majority of people go for. So you can move from something like 5% reuse of towels to 70% reuse of towels just by changing the default option. So extremely powerful. Similarly, giving by default only walking instructions from one place to another uh, or um, how people can reach your uh, your business or your attraction, again, is an extremely powerful um, solution, especially in destinations such as um, uh, uh, in Sweden, certainly Stockholm, where public transportation and walking is actually quite, quite uh, possible and easy. Another approach is to make sustainability impossible to resist. So psychologically, um, it's much more effective to not try to educate people what is the respons responsible and ethical uh, thing to do, but actually to describe the more sustainable option in a way that makes it very, very irresistible. So, for example, instead of suggesting that... Um, the 100% uh, local uh, meatballs on our menu are um, uh, the option that helps support the local, uh, the local economy or the local farmers. You can simply use words that make the meal so irresistible that people choose it because it, they really want to have it and because it's strongly desired. Getting people away from hotspots to less visited uh, part of a destination um, or less visited attractions should not be driven by um, messages that say that this is the, the better thing to do and that this helps offset some of the negative footprints, but rather because it's <clears throat> the secret spot um, to observe um, a natural phenomena or um, the preferred by locals um, morning walk or something like that. So using um, the tactic of describing sustainability as impossible to resist is something that can make sustainable options more desirable. And again, making sustainability non-negotiable, similar to the breaking example I gave you. You know that many, and this is also, I, I see that throughout uh, throughout the Nordics, Nordics, um, 
many businesses um, have already moved to ensuring that the entire journey that they offer is plastics free. And they do that either by, by inviting people to bring their, their own reusable bottle or by automatically giving them a reusable bottle, by uh, making sure that water stops and refill stations are very visible and they're part of the, um, the experience that uh, uh, guests are having. So in essence, they make the uh, plastic free behavior part of the design and in a way eliminate the likelihood that somebody will actually reach out and um, and even obtain uh, a single use plastic bottle. Um, now, if you make that um, uh, even more engaging and exciting by uh, getting people to bring their own bottle, by declaring that you are um, uh, holding a competition for the craziest bottle design or something like that, would add gamification and fun and make uh, this kind of behavior even more exciting for people to engage in without even bringing up um, sustainability and ethics. In a similar manner, transitioning to 100% local ingredients for your desserts, for your meals, is something that, and uh, aligning with uh, uh, seasonal availability of food, is again another example of how uh, you can make uh, sustainability part of the uh, part of the design. In your case, you have um, an opportunity to also influence behavior behaviors, not only through individual business actions, but also by uh, coordinated destination level actions. And this is extremely powerful because in a similar manner, relatively easy uh, and um, uninvasive measures can actually help address things such as managing behavioral patterns and visitor flows on destination level with some smart um, um, design of uh, uh, green spaces, with some smart use of uh, information signs, of physical infrastructure, you can influence how people move, where they go first, how they time um, their spend, uh, how they uh, spend their time at the destination and how long they actually spend there. Um, another approach is providing impact information of the different options, but very, very importantly, at the moment when the decision is being made. The example that I have here actually is on how this tactic is used um, uh, at restaurant level. Uh, this is a, a solution. Actually, it's a Swedish company called Carbon Cloud that helps restaurants produce very precise estimate of the carbon footprint of their different meals mm -hmm. and use something um, as uh, simple as a green, yellow, red signaling system to, to help people immediately see which, means are, or which meals are greener and which are um, higher uh, carbon footprint. Now, the appearance of this information at the moment of the decision actually has an impact um, and it's not to be underestimated. It increases the likelihood that the uh, green meal will be selected with between 11 and 25%. Of course, it doesn't replace our preference for taste or our um, uh, dietary restrictions, but it does have an influence when it's presented at the uh, choice moment. Similarly, if you give people different uh, access options or different transportation options, and you simply indicate um, which is the greener option, this is likely to have an impact on them and to change patterns um, overall. And then one more thing that could be done at destination level, just as an example, is to offer irresistible awards for desire, desired behavior. What do I mean? Um, one of the projects uh, that we currently have is in Ticino region uh, in the Italian part of Switzerland. And one of the really fantastic best practices I've seen uh, on destination level comes from them. And that's um, the launch of a program called the Ticino Ticket, which basically makes, um, makes it possible for every guest in the city to receive a free ticket to public transportation. Of course, it's not free. And of course, it's again funded through uh, to traveler spending. Uh, but ultimately, because it's framed in a way that is free for the traveler, it becomes so irresistible that, again, you have to be an extremely stubborn person to actually go and rent a car and spend on fuel and engage in traffic jams when you actually have free access to public transportation, 
savings on attractions and so on. So coming up with smart ways to reorganize funding and flip sources so that you can do something that is completely irresistible and low carbon, because most of the movement now happens on train and um, desirable in terms of um, uh, social impact because you're not contributing to traffic jams is really, really a fantastic way to uh, influence behavior at the destination level. Offering irresistible um, uh, incentives such as making something available at low visitation times, for example, such as uh, um, a unique dessert or something else can again be uh, something like uh, uh, something that can influence uh, behaviors in the right direction. So to conclude, uh, I know that I gave you just a few examples, but what I wanted to, to suggest is that with sometimes seemingly small and easy things, um, we can change our practices uh, as businesses and destinations mm -hmm. in ways that are non-invasive but that actually can drive and influence behavior change. And I know many of you will say, okay, but these are small. We need to be solving a large crisis. But in fact, in may, if many of us do something small, it contributed to something big. And if a traveler or a guest in your destination comes along and stops at different attractions and businesses, and they always see that sustainability is actually made easy for them, that changes the norm. It makes sustainability constantly present in the, um, in the experience, and it changes the overall context, again, similar to that uh, driving context. The second thing that the smart uh, changes executed by uh, many at the same time do is that by changing the context, it actually gives us an opportunity to stop hoping that we can only bring to our businesses the right travelers who know how to behave, who will pay more for sustainability um, and so on. By setting the context appropriately, we will actually make most travelers the right travelers, similar to the driving example earlier. And the other argument that they want to uh, share in terms of using the smart behavior changes is that easy sustainability can actually become part of smart business because in many cases, most of the guests that you serve um, are conscious about sustainability and they want to be responsible. It's just that when they're in leisure mode, they 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 op they prioritize other things. So if you make it easy for them to be responsible and you make them aware of that, that has um, uh, desired improvement on their satisfaction. In some cases, it actually optimizes your costs and performance. And also it's associated with some creative and smart business thinking. So with this, I hope that I have piqued your interest in uh, understanding how human behavior or knowledge about human behavior can help us um, uh, make sustainability easier and more likely and non-negotiable in our industry in a similar way as other industries have benefited from this. And hopefully uh, you will see that there is a point in using these smart and seemingly easy changes in order to address the big challenge that we have ahead of us. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I know you're on a limited uh, schedule, so I can take questions now, but I'm also happy to address some questions after that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So do we have some questions? No fraga? No some pandera? I I um I, I think that the, the conclusion that you had is really interesting because starting off saying, you know, people naturally when they are on vacation, they don't want to care about sustainability. And a lot of times people think then oh then we don't have to do it either but it's really a little bit about making pe helping people to make the right choices huh uh, exactly. so, yeah absolutely yeah and making it uh in a way that uh we talk a lot about the green gap 
we know what we do, but we don't do it. <laughs> exactly. That makes anxiety. We can help people to narrow that green gap. Yes, and it will have um, uh, business and satisfaction benefits. Yes, yes, absolutely. And if you read the report, you'll get those little uh, tips on how to do that to make this a, a good and smart, smart part of your business. Okay, absolutely. thank you very much. We're going to say thank you to you and hope to see you again here at Google absolutely. next time in person. Good luck absolutely. in your roundtable talk thank you. today. Thank you. Thank you We're so much. Say goodbye. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.